Okay, for those who have been here before or watching on Zoom, we always start with a little music, a little nigun to get us in, in the mood for learning. So this nigun that I'm going to sing uh, just came to me a few days ago. <clears throat> and usually I don't put it to words already, but I, I, I put it to words almost immediately. And it happens to come from Powell today. So, um, no, actually, I'm sorry. It did not come from Powell. Okay. It comes from Suki to Zimra that we say every morning. Every morning in Yehi Kabod, two different verses. They don't go right one after the other, but they're both from the same um, part of Suki to Zimra. I did ding die, 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 ding ding die, ding die, Continuing with our series of, it's actually called Women in the Tanakh. But today we're going to do post Tanakh. We're going to deal with the last 2,000 years of history and different women. Of course, there are many, many, many women we could mention. We only have a limited amount of time. So uh, my wife is going to begin. And it's going to be more or less um, in chronological order. So my wife is going to start with a, a couple that are, go way back, and then one from the five, six hundred years ago. And then the rest will be from the inception of the Hasidic movement until today. I'm actually going to flip it because I'm starting with my mom. My, my mother's yard site was on Sunday, so I wanted to dedicate the lesson today for Louis Nishmat Fega Bat Nachman David. And my mom had a lot of Fahmat uh, Nashi, a lot of women's wisdom. And when I, when we, I see in history, as I'm doing the research about these historical women, I see my mom had a real oral tradition going back to 
the ancient women. And one of them was a very famous uh, personality. She was Raphael, the, the daughter of Kalba Savua. Kalba Savua in his time was called Kalba Savua because he was so wealthy that anyone who came to him hungry as a dog was able to leave completely satiated. Kalba, Caleb, Savua, satiated dog. Somebody was hungry as a dog. But he had a daughter who you know, was like a princess. She was very wealthy. And at the, at the time that she was um, the, the, about to be married, there was a shepherd who was working for her father, who was an ignoramus. But somehow she connected to him. You know who we're talking about? Akiva. Rabbi Akiva. So I think she was the very first Kolel wife. <laughs> now, and she, according to the legend, she sold her hair to be able to afford to give him the money to go to, to learn because her father disinherited her when she decided to make an alliance with, with Akiva, who was a simple shepherd. And he made a vow that she would not benefit from any of his wealth. And so after the 24 years of Rabbi Akiva, starting out by his, his going to school with his eight-year-old son and not getting at all what his son was getting like this, he couldn't get it. He couldn't understand the alpha. He couldn't understand how to read. But, and he was so ashamed of himself. He went out of the, the, the hater. He went out into the hillsides. I think he went to uh, the cave in front of our house, which is from the Byzantian era, but it was more ancient. <laughs> and he saw water dripping there and eating away at the stone. And he said, "If is my mind harder than stone? If water, which is something that is so soft, can eat away at something so hard as stone, surely if I allow one drop at a time to fall upon my brain, it will eventually get in there. I can't give up. And he went back into Heder and he became Yikiva. But she's, you know, they were, they were so poor at one time, Rabbi Yikiva and his wife's name was Rachel, which is my namesake, that they, they had nothing but straw for furniture. And they were sleeping on straw. And they saw this in heaven, like how much self-sacrifice they were making. And there's a certain part of this story that I just hate. That I, she suffered so much, Rachel. And she gave up so much, but look what it brought us. It's like the whole oral tradition. Anyhow, so uh, they were tested. In heaven, they said, this can't be for real. These people have to be fake. And we're gonna, uh, we're gonna test them. Eliyahu and Nabi came in the guise of a poor man who said his wife had just given birth and they have no straw whatsoever. And so they gave them, Rachel and Akiva gave them, gave this Eliyahu and Nabi character half of their straw. And they said, okay, this, this guy breaks the mold. This couple, they break the mold. They're for real. And so we're going to bless him. And that's how he became so great. So after the 12 years of his absence, you know, this is all brought down in the second ketubah because a man has an obligation to his wife in the ketubah that he has to be with her intimately at least a certain amount of times during the year, depending upon what his occupation is. And so how did he get a, a leave of absence to be able to be away for 12 years? Okay, there's different opinions. Maybe he came home for Shabbos. Maybe, you know, he was able to, to fulfill, fulfill his, his marital obligation then, but we don't know. What we know is that he was away for 12 years learning. And a neighbor was saying, um, you know, like, oh, don't you miss your husband? It's been 12 years already. And she said, oh, if only he would go for another 12 years. And, and so he turned around and he overheard this conversation and he went back for another 12 years. After the 24 years, I hope you, you're familiar with the story that the, Rabbi Akiva was expounding in the public square and you know, everyone went out to see him. And Rachel wanted to see him also and pay homage to him and give him honor, because of, not because of his personality, not because of his talents, but because of the Torah that he had been learning for all this time and that he was giving over to Israel, And she pushed her way through the crowd and on her way, one of her neighbors said, well, at least you could wear some nice clothes. She was dressed in rags because that's all she had. She was, remember, still impoverished. Her father had disowned her. She, but she said, no, it's, it's um, 
the, the, the quote that is given in the Talmud, it says, Yodea tzaddik nefesh behem tov, that every righteous person knows the soul of his flock, of his flock. So she was the most faithful of his flock, a little new, new lamb, a little lamb. And so they also say that um, uh, Imra in, in Che, Rachela Batar Rachela Azla. So what does that mean? A Rachel, my namesake, this Rachel is, is a new lamb, a female lamb and the mother lamb. And it says, if you want to see what a woman is going to be like, look at her mother. So my mother, Fago Batnach and David, had a wonderful sense of humor. She was the glue that held the family together. She made peace between all of the, all of the family members. If one family member was going to say something derogatory about another family, family member, she would go like this and say, uh-uh-uh, no luxury horror. And everybody would laugh and it would break the tension. And, but that was my mother. So it says, uh, Imra Inche, that means it's a, a, a folk saying that the lamb will go after the mother lamb. So th this is what she was like. So she went up to Rabbi Akiva in her rags. She didn't bother to change his borrowed clothing. She fell down at his feet, was kissing his feet, and his attendants were trying to shoo her away. And they and but Rabbi Akiva stood up for her and said, No, my Torah and your Torah is all because of her, and gave her the honor that that, that she richly deserved. And at that moment, Kava Sabur was there also, all the big shots were there. And he said, and Rabbi Akiva, you know, like said, if if I had known that you were going to be such a great person, I would never have made that vow. And Rabbi Kiva asked him, would you have made that vow if you had known? And he said, even if you only knew one Mishnah, I wouldn't have made the vow. And so he, would be, he released himself from the vow. And in the end of her days, she was able to be restored to her former luxurious lifestyle at the end of her days. So there was hope. You hang on to the kolel long enough. She sold her hair. She sold her hair to be able to now that's I've seen that also in the bat mitzvah parties that young girls will sell their will sell their hair and have it remade into a wig for people who have suffered that the baby shook up from, from cancer and became bald because of the cancer treatments. And I've seen this in, in several bar bat mitzvah parties, so proud of these young girls. Their whole glory is their hair, and they would go so far as to make this self sacrifice. There's, there's we've got a rich tradition of this going on for us of Jerusalem. Okay, next in line is actually a student of Rabbi Akiva, you know, the 24,000 students who just observed the whole, the, the, the time of the spirit of Almir. The students of Rabbi Akiva, you know, like uh, they had some, some troubles and they died off. Then it was started all over again with five students. And one of them was Rabbi Meir. And we say, Stam Mishnah, Rabbi Meir. Any, if it's an ordinary mission and it's not given a certain title, that said, this one said it, that one said it, it's automatically known that it's Rebbe Mayer speaking. So we have the wife of Rebbe Mayer, Buria. And we have a lot of problems with, with this Buria character. Has everyone heard of her? Sure. Okay, so you know about Buria. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you are some, some little known things about her that I found out as I was doing the research. So first of all, part of my mother's wisdom was when my dad would come home from work, she would warn me and say, don't hit him up for money when he walks in the door. Let him come in, sit down, have a nice refreshing drink, have a nice meal, and then hit him up. Then talk to him about practical details. You want this, you want that. You want to borrow a car, whatever. Uh, just give him that chance. So Gruria showed this wisdom, you know, the famous story on Shabbos when the two sons died. She never happened to anyone in the plague, the two sons died. And instead of just spilling it out and, and being overwhelmed with her own emotions, she controlled herself. And she revealed it to him very gradually. First of all, by saying, you know, if we were given something, if we borrowed something, if we were given a loan, do we have to return the loan? And of course, of 
course he said, yes, you have to return the, the thing that you were, that you borrowed. And so that only then after he came in and he, and he made Havdalah, first she had him set, all set up to make Havdalah. She didn't want to reveal it on Shabbos. She wasn't going to take away from the, the holiness of Shabbos. He made Havdalah. Only after she gave him a Malava Malka, he had something to eat. This is my mom. Where did she get it from? From Korea. Bachmat Nashi, Banta Beta. That's what it says in Mishra. Only, only after he had eaten. And she kept putting him up. Where are my sons? Where are my sons? He kept asking her. Finally, she took him by the hand and said, okay, this is the Picadon. This is what we were given. This is what we borrowed from Hashem. These two Mishambo. Do we have to return them? And only then did she and he break down crying. Now, Gloria had more troubles than it should happen to anyone. Her father was Hananya ben Tradio, who's one of the, the uh, 10 martyrs that we remember on Yom Kippur. Her mother was sold into slavery by the Romans. She lived in around the year 200, about, uh, about um, after the destruction of the Second Temple. Her sister was sold into a brothel. So it says that at one point, Rabbi Meir had to flee Eretz Israel. The Romans were after him. And here's the story of why. Rabbi, she was very troubled. Gloria was so troubled that her sister was sold into a brothel. And she said to her husband there, can't you do something about this? And so, you know, to do anything against the authorities was like risking your life at that time. So he went to, to, to the brothel. Some people say that he dressed up as a, as a peasant so that he would look like he was a customer for the brothel. And he went to the guard. He had this bag of certain number, 72 cobs, it says, like, uh, like it was a, a certain amount of weight of gold. And he takes this with him to bribe the guard at the brothel. And he says, I'm gonna first test to see if she, if she was defiled or not. And so he approached her and he, she didn't recognize him because he was dressed not like a mayor, he was dressed like a, pe a peasant. And he, he approached her and he said, you know, would, would you be with me? And she said, oh, I can't, uh, the way of women is upon me now. And so he realized, aha, she's already pushing me away. She's already, and, and he said to her, but I'll wait for you. And she said, oh, but then I've been sick recently. I have a sickness. You don't want to catch my sickness. And so he realized that she had not been defiled. And so he took the guard and he said, give half of this money to the authorities, pay them off. And you use the rest for, you, for yourself to, to, to you know, and just you keep the rest of it. And so the guard said to him, but what am I gonna do when I run out of cash? He said, I, you know, I can't, this isn't gonna last forever. They're gonna eventually suspect me that I let her go. And he said, if you get into any trouble, Say this phrase, and remember this, ladies, write it down if you have to make a reminder. It says, just say this phrase, Eloka de Mayor Aneni. The God of Mayor, answer me. Eloka, Eloka, Eloka de Mayor of the, the God of Mayor, answer me. And so the guard did this, and he was, and but he got caught. The guard let, let Maria's sister leave. Rabbi Mayer went off with her, and but they caught the guard and they were going to hang him. And one thing after another happened. The trap door didn't open under his feet. The rope broke. Something else happened three times. And there's some kind of common law that if a, an executioner doesn't succeed three times, the, the accused goes free. So they let him free. They let the guard go free. But only after he said, Eloka de Mayer Aneni. And we have this tradition ever since because of Gloria, because of Gloria's sister, because of Rabbi Mayer's bravery to fight against the authorities and not to give in. So it's said that you know, Mayer, Rabbi Mayer had to flee to Babylonia. Some say it was because of this embarrassment that, they, that the family had because of the mother was sold into slavery and the daughter was sold into a brothel. And this was the embarrassment. Others say, that it was a different test that Rabbi Meir set up for, for Buria. Buria is quoted in the Talmud approximately 14 times. Now, this is unusual for a woman to be cited as a halakhic authority. It said about her that she taught over 300 halakhas every single day. 
And it said like she knew more than, than some of the other sages. And, and people were like jealous of her. And so Ridden Mayor even like was thinking like, what's going on here? And they used to say in those times, Nashim datan kala aleha, that women are like-minded. If they can't study Tama, they can't, in our days, everything is not foku, everything has been upturned. We, have, we live in awesome times for women. We have in front, uh, the ability to learn everything. Everything's at our fingertips. Something that never happened before. This is unusual. She was a very unusual case that she was so learned. Like the daughters of Rashi much later also were very learned women because their father sat with them and learned with them. Okay, so so what happened with Guria? I mean, there, this is a legend that it's only brought by Rashi. It's not brought in the times of the Talmud. And the reason that they had to flee was because of the incident of Ruria. What was the incident? The Rabbi Mayer told one of his students to try to test her, to see, is she really light-minded? Is she like all other women? Is she going to, because she's so smart, is she going to also fall to her, to her Yetzirah? And the student tested her, and he repeated over and over again, day after day after day, trying to, like the, the reverse of what happened to Yosef in, in the, the house of Hodipa. Tempting her, tempting her, tempting her, till finally she gave in. And when she realized that it was the mayor who set this up, she, there are some opinions who say that she actually committed suicide, that she hung herself. <coughs> she was so embarrassed. And that was the reason why the mayor had to flee, was the incident of Gloria. But this isn't from the original Talmudic sources. This comes from a much later time, from the time of Rashi, who brings it as a commentary in Masechet um, Bodhisattva. So that's how we want, how we know about it is in that commentary. Okay, but we so we have this problematic issue here, but we still have the intensity of her of her brilliance, and she is still remembered. She wasn't stricken from the Talmud, despite the the shady issues that were surrounding her and her family. She still appears there. She still has something to teach us. Okay, so now I have a. Yeah. But she didn't commit suicide. So that's all I know. So she didn't commit suicide. Okay, what? Well, I have to put this in because this is a case where everyone everyone who talks about Bruria will state she committed suicide. But Rafa and I went over a whole bunch of sources that because it's only brought in Rashi. About 800 years later, there's no other Midrashic or Talmudic source that this is what happened. And so after Rashi, um, without going into all the details, but there are many, many commentaries that said that, that, that um, there's a suspicion that Rashi didn't actually write this, this was added later in Rashi's name, and they were incredulous that Rabbi Mayer would have set up such a test. And um, almost all the commentaries say that even if he tested her, there's no way that they went through with it. And others- Yes, yeah, some uh, say that this young man that tested her was sterile and he could never have slept with her anyhow. And it could never have happened. And, and they, they, they find lots of ways to go like this and say it never happened, but we don't know. We still have what to learn from her regardless. Right, but it was just, it just that, again, this is, a, this is a, an example of sometimes people quote something as if this is the absolute only way to look at it. But when we looked in it, we saw many commentaries that doubted this tradition altogether. And they brought all kinds of different reasons why they doubted it. So we have Rashi who brings this, but then you have a whole lot of others that say she never committed suicide. And um, they even doubt if this whole incident occurred. So I just wanted to put that up. Right, so I do want to go back to the, the, the daughter of Kabo Sabua, that her and Rabbi Akiva's daughter married Ben Azai, who was also one of the, the sages. And so she also did the same self-sacrifice of enabling her husband to, to go to Kolam. <laughs> okay. 
Great. Okay, so now um, we're taking it to a more modern time, the time of the Inquisition in Lisbon. Now there was a personality, I, I, I raise your hand if you've heard of her. Her um, converso name was Beatrice de Luna. Anybody? Gra Dona Gracia Nassi. Dona Gracia Nassi was widowed at a very young age. She was married into the house of Mendes. Now, if you look at the, many of the Spanish names end with a Z. When they added a Z to a name, it was as if a suspect, if for the sake of the Inquisition, that this was a, a, a Jew who had falsely converted. So Perez, uh, Mendoza, the, a lot of these Span the Spanish names, she, but her family name was also Ben Benisti. So if you know anybody from the great Sephardic traditions of the, with the name Ben Benisti, this was also part of the legacy. So she, her husband, um, her late husband was in, in, the, in the house of Mendez and um, she was widowed and she realized that the, the, uh, she had to maintain this facade of being a loyal Christian and a Catholic and to boot. And she um, wanted to, because of her great wealth, she couldn't just pick up and leave without leaving all of her wealth behind. So she, she developed, she was very clever. She developed two plans. She always had an exit plan. She would have plan A and plan B. Her plan A was to take some of the spice ships that her husband was, uh, the business that, that funded the bank was spices. And spices didn't mean just like pepper. It also meant precious gems and jewelry and other precious objects that were traded across the spice route. Now, they developed spice routes that went around the Horn of Africa. They developed a huge shipping empire, and much of it was, was located in Antwerp. So if her brother, Diogo, um, her brother-in-law, Diogo, was able to um, maintain the business from Antwerp, which the, the imposition was not as severe there as it was in the Iberian <laughs> Peninsula. So she was gradually, gradually funneling off her money to, to, to Antwerp. So her plan A was she was going to board one of these spice ships where many refugees, Jews who were trying to escape the Inquisition and didn't have the means to, to do what she was doing, which was to save others, but just were trying to save themselves, would be smuggled on these spice ships to go to far-flung places that were out of the reach of the, of the Inquisition. <coughs> one of them was in Goa, India which was, became a center of a refuge point for, for Jews who were escaping the Inquisition. And that, that's one of the reasons why the uh, Cochin Indian community dates itself from, from you know, the time of the Second Temple, actually. And, and, even, and they welcomed these Jews as refugees who came from, um, from Spain and Portugal. So she, um, there were other plan was to appeal to the Duke. Now this, there was a Duke there in, in, um, in uh, Portugal who wanted to, her two-year-old daughter to be married into their royal family. And she didn't want this to happen because once uh, she would remarry, if she never remarried, if she would remarry the, the, in those days, the funds that belonged to her would automatically go to the husband. That was the common law in those, in those times. And so she didn't remarry. She didn't want her daughter to marry the Duke also. So she, could, she appealed to the Duke, but she would ask for special permission from the Pope to travel to Antwerp where her brother-in-law was. And then she would get the amount of money she needed from the business to be able to pay the taxes to the Duke. And by paying him off, she would release her daughter, this two-year-old, from being engaged to one of these nobility of the, of, the, of the Portuguese nobility. So she engineered this whole plan B. In, in the end, she actually did wind up in Antwerp and the, the, the long arm of the Inquisition was reaching out to all of these different places. She left Antwerp on the way to Ferrara, Italy, and she stopped in Dubrovnik which is now known as Dubrovnik, but it was called Rugosa in those days. And she made a business deal on the way, you know, a great business deal for shipping and for the spice trade. And so she wound up in Ferrara, Italy, 
And at that time, um, the, the Inquisition was also beginning to, to reach out to there. And she loaned the, the, the Sultan of Turkey an enormous amount of money from the bank, or from the, the House of Mendes Bank. And he was beholden to her. And he, and, and, and he, you know, she's asking, please pay up because I need to get out of here quickly. I need to leave Ferrara. And he, he like saved her. She was actually arrested and was about to be interrogated by the Inquisition when the Sultan of Turkey stepped in and literally saved her skin and her daughter and, and put, him, put them under his protection. And in exchange for that, the huge amount of money that she lent him and saved his, his hide, he also gave her the permission to start a colony in Tiberias. Now you can go to see Donna Gracia Nasi's house, which is like a, a beautiful boutique hotel in the you know, old part of Tiberias near the sea. It's made out of basalt stone, the black stone, and, and it's a, a museum hotel that every floor of the hotel tells the story of her life and her amazing her amazing brilliance and her strategies and how she she was able to to uh, to save her wealth and to create refuges for the, all of these Jews who were escaping the Inquisition, including those who came into the into the Ottoman Empire for protection, because the Muslim Turks were were out of the reach of the of the Inquisition. So we have these wonderful female like. Um, dynamic, incredibly intelligent personalities. At one time, um, the Queen uh, Marie, uh, the Regent of the Netherlands, proposed a shidduch for her daughter. <coughs> and in order to, to, to sidestep this, she couldn't marry into that family, even though she, took, she had the name of Beatrice de Luna as her converso name, she was really Doña Gracia Nassi. Nassi is, means the leaders of the people. And she was able to stand up to this, this very uh, powerful personality, the queen of the Netherlands, and to resist making a shidda for her daughter. So, uh, so women, Nashim Datan Kalale, are women lightheaded? I, I don't know. Rabbi Mayer, we have some contention here. And we will continue until the women are able to prove themselves as we're able to in our times. That I can open at the Mara now without being burned at the stake. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair. Yeah, fair. Kalat Rosh, Masa Kalat Rosh, Kisha Ishatsi Irami Tareset. On the good side of Kalandrosh, if you spell it with a kaf, that means that the, all the young girls who need a shidda, halavai, the merit of this learning, that they should find their true shidda, someone who will support their learning, like our heroines supported their husband's learnings. Okay, now we're going to jump. Um, about from the Inquisition, so we're jumping around three, four hundred years. And we're going to start with the daughter of the Baal Shem Tov. The daughter of the Baal Shem Tov, her name was Udo, um, which is very close to Edel. Edel means refined, sensitive. My mother's name was Adelaide. So um, it's like a play on words, but uh, it's close to uh, Udo. And uh, according to tradition, uh, the Baal Shem Tov named her that from, from a pasuk, Eish Dat Lamo, that's in um, Zot Abracha, part of the many, many blessings that Moshe gives over to the people before he, he leaves this world. And in, in there, the, the Torah is referred to as a fiery law to his people. And he named her Udo, which is Rashi Tevot, um, Eish Dat Lamo. It's said about her that uh, it was a huge, huge change 
my wife mentioned that, of course, there were learned women um, throughout the ages, especially women's knowledge and how to run a home and, and how to teach the children. Um, but you don't have that many cases where it's like Bruria, where it's openly talked about their, their Torah knowledge. Daughters of Rashi are, in a sense, are the exception. Not that they were the exception, but we don't really have cases that we talk about. But it's known within Hasidic circles that the Baal Shem Tov taught her just like he taught his son. And uh, she was considered, I'm talking about like the, the depths of Kabbalah. And without going into the whole story, if you don't have time, the Baal Shem Tov made an attempt to come to Eretz Yisrael. He, he wasn't coming just for himself. He, he felt he, he was trying to like open the gates for a whole new energy in the world. And according to tradition, he was given many signs from heaven, don't go. But he, he went anyway. But the important thing is he only took two people with him, his daughter, Udo, and one of his close students. Um, the Hirsch Sofer. So the fact that the only, only people he took, one of them was his daughter, tells us a huge amount about his daughter. There are many, many stories of what happened uh, along the way. Uh, we don't have, have time for it. But in the end, they did not make it. They made it as far as in, in, in Istanbul. And then from Istanbul, the boat that they were taking to come to Eretz Israel was pirated and they, they almost died and they barely made it back to Europe uh, alive. But it, it's important to mention um, how, how the Baal Shem Tov uh, thought of his daughter and treated his daughter. After the Baal Shem passed away, it was known that for one year, his son became like the Rebbe of the Hasidic movement, but he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't that kind of material. And then one year later, the Magid of Nezuc uh, took over, it was like the fledging um, Hasidic movement, and he turned it into a, a real movement. But during those years, it was known that you could go to Udo for not just blessings, but for advice. And many of the greatest Hasidim then would go to, would go to her because it was recognized that she had a Masora from the Baal Shem Tov. There's one story that just um, like points out how smart she was, even as a child. It was uh, Rosh Hashanah. And it was time to go to shul, and she was sleeping. So the Baal Shem was, uh, was a little bit impatient because she had to get up now and get dressed and everything. And so he woke her up and kind of said, like, you know, it's Rosh Hashanah. Why are you sleeping now? And she said, well, our mother always taught us that when you want to get a child to sleep, you tell them the best of the meal will save for you. So that's all she said. But the Baal Shem, like it just inspired him. He went to Shul and he, he, he stood in front of the ark and said, Rabbana Sha'olam, did you hear that? You're, the exile has put your, your, your people to sleep but we know that you're saving the best for Am Yisrael. And I want to hold you to it. That you're saving the best when we, when we wake up. So this is just an example. As, as a little girl, she inspired the Baal Shem Tov with, with, with her, her cleverness. Her daughter, Udo, got married and her daughter was Fega who gave birth to Rebbe Nachman of Breslau. So Rebbe Nachman comes to Udo. 
she comes to Udom, and of course to Baal Shem Tov. And her, her son was Rav Boruch of uh, Medjugorje, who became a very, very famous Rebbe, who was Rebbe Nachman's uncle. And so Udo's uh, lineage got carried on to Rebbe Nachman. And despite the fact that when Rebbe Nachman passed away, they say that his, at his very, very, very height, he had maybe a thousand followers. But of those, the, the, the close knit was much smaller than that. Now, okay, pre COVID, you have between 30 and 40,000 people who go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, not counting the whole rest of the year. And there's actually, it's like, um, it, it, it's amazing in the neighborhood where the, the Kever is, like everything is in Hebrew. It's like, it's like Jews have taken over and it's a bit controversial because the Ukraine has, as we know, a very, very uh, bloody history when it comes to the Jews. On the other hand, bordering on miraculous, the, the present president of Ukraine is Jewish. And he was elected by the Ukrainian people. And he, he made no attempt to hide his Jewishness. And he's not religious but he, he's known to be very supportive of Ukrainian Jewry. So you see that like, there is a, a lot of uh, energy going both ways. There's a lot of problems of anti-Semitism in Ukraine and especially in Uman because of the very, very uh, presence of so many, so many Jews. Okay, now, we're going to go on to a, a woman named Yenta. Yeah. Do a family dispute as to who I asked for a while. Is the name connected to Eno at all, or is it really a separate name? According to tradition, it's Eish dat Lamo. But Udo is the Yiddish, as far as I understand, for Edo. It's like Kegel and Kugel. But I feel like Eish. <laughs> And I understand that. I, I, I understand that. The, the, the closest, oh yeah? I'm the only one who has an title. Everyone else means, you know, after, after my grandmother. Okay. And I always say that can't possibly be the same name. It's, it's, it's also you know, huddle. It's more of a drusha. Huddle, huddle. It's like uh, all of these Yiddishized Names. Right. The, right. The idea of Udo being H. Lamo, that is the real tradition. Uh -huh. The idea of connecting it to Adol is like a drusha. It's like a, it's like a drusha. But that's the tradition. That's he named it. In fact, it's brought down that a soul on the level of the Baal Shem Tov or any Sadiq has the power to draw down specific souls. That's why throughout history, there are many exceptions, many exceptions, but how many times do you have rabbis who then give birth to rabbis who give birth to rabbis? Okay, it's, it's, it's the nature and nurture, but there is this idea that we have the power to draw down a soul. And it's added that when a person of this level has the intent of connecting it to a Pusik, that that Pusik um, invigorates that soul. I just read this uh, this week. So it's really Udal is H. Lamo. That's like the real tradition. Okay. Back to Yenta. She's the daughter of Yechiel Mikhail of Zlochov. He was one of the first students of the Baal Shem Tov, of the very, very first. And he had a daughter named Yenta. She was married. And she was already known to be an unusually spiritual um, personality. So one time, her husband came home 
and she's in the kitchen doing sponja. And he walks in and she sees, she drops the mop and she goes up on her toes and says, Kedusha. And, and the husband got worried, like this is not normal behavior. So he went to the Baal Shem Tov and he, and he told him what happened. And, and, the, and he was worried. And the Baal Shem says, no, no, no. Your wife is on the level. I can assure you that she was hearing the angels in heaven saying the Kedusha and she was joining in. And after this incident, the, the Baal Shem said, your wife is Yenta, the prophetess. And she was known like that for the rest of her life. But she, she was considered like, like on the level of hearing the angels. And they say that when she would go out to the forest to do Hebota, this is before Rabbi Nachman, the Baal Shem Tov used to do Hebota, that also she would hear the angels praising God in heaven. And she would join them in the Kedusha. Listen, we join every morning. We say Kadosh, 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 because we're joining the angels. Halavai, we were on the level to actually hear the angels. She was on the level. And so the Baal Shem says, this is Yenta the, the prophetess. Do you see that? You are Oh uh, yeah, right. So this is this is a tikkun, right? This is a real a real tikkun here. Okay, now we have the, now we have um, Malka, the wife of the first Belzer Rebbe, who was um, Shalom Rokeach, who was the first in the line of bells. As we know, in Eretz Yisrael, bells is perhaps bells and gear are among the the biggest of all Hasidic groups. And it was known in Bells, and from what I hear that until this day, because of the precedent that the Rebbe set, he um, took advice from his wife on everything. He included her in all the decisions of the community of all the big decisions he had to make. And it was known, it was known that he, he would uh, take counsel from his wife. And one story that is quoted uh, very often, just an example, is once someone who was suffering from a, uh, a hurt foot came to the Belzer Rebbe for a bracha. And he was not available. And so she, she said, well, uh, my husband is not available, but you know, just tell me what the problem is. So he told her and she said, um, she quoted a, a, a verse, ner l'ragli devarecha, a candle to my feet are your words. So she said, you should, light, you should light a candle every day and your foot will get better. So he did it and his foot got better. But he, he again, because in those days, people were not used to maybe getting um, brachas. Hmm? Because, because it says, verse. the verse is near yeah, the the a the candle to, your, to, um, to, to the feet are your words. So based on that verse, your foot is hurting, so light a candle. So when this man came back, he understood that she gave the advice that she knew that her husband would give. So he came back to thank him. And he said, no, I didn't know anything about this. My wife gave you a bracha. And so he went to his wife and said, how did you know to give this advice? 
So she quoted the verse. She said, it's right in the verse. It's right in the verse. That a candle like lights the way of the foot. It's also known that the Belzer Rebbe at one time when he was younger and not quite known, he, stood, he stayed up for a thousand nights in a row, learning all night. Like David and Mel, he would get up at midnight and he would stay up all night learning. That's not an easy discipline. And so she would stay up with him. And if he was about to fall asleep, she would make sure he didn't fall asleep. And she really was, was his support. Now I'm jumping because this same thing is known about the wife of the, the Baba Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Malka. Malka. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Chaya Mushka was the Lubavitcher Rebbe's wife. So I'm just jumping to her because. Yeah. Right, right. So um, she was a very, very modest, hidden woman. Um, to this day, people don't know that much about her because she, she stayed out of the limelight completely. But it was known because for many years, the, the Rebbe would do uh, have yachidas every night. People would come and they'd have private audiences. Later, it just became too much and he would take groups. And then later, he, he couldn't do that anymore. But it was known, and we actually heard this from Rav Shlomo Karlbach, who used to bring people to the Rebbe in the middle of the night, um, literally to save their souls. And the Rebbe would be up many times until, until dawn. His wife would stay up because she never knew when he would come home. And she would always have a cup of tea ready for him when he came home. And it was known that every day he would take a break and go home so he could spend time with his wife. They didn't have guests because the Rebbe felt that he's giving himself to the, to the people all the time. Shabbos is from his wife, right? They never had children. Right? They never had children. And so really he spent most of the time uh, on Shabbos and Yom Tov with, with his wife. But the, the key thing here is, you know the expression uh, behind every great man is a great woman. So the story is when the, when the Friedrich Rebbe passed away, he did not make it explicit who would take over for him. Now, the, the, the Rebbe was very close to his son-in-law, but the, the Friedrich Rebbe had two daughters. And the Rebbe married the younger daughter and the husband of the older daughter was also a, was on the level Rari. to be the to be the rebbe. He was he was also very close to the Friedrich Rebbe, and very involved in the whole Lubavitch organization. As remember back then, it was a relatively small organization, but the two sons-in-law were like the pillars of the community. But he never said who should take over. It was clear among the, um, the Hasidim that they wanted the Rebbe, but for a whole year, the Rebbe, he loved his brother-in-law, and he knew that his sister-in-law expected that her husband would be the Rebbe. And for a whole year, he refused to be the Rebbe because he didn't want a family machlogat, and he, he had tremendous pressure to become the Rebbe. And he, and he put it off. And it, the story is that finally his wife said to him, if you don't become the Rebbe, all that my father <coughs> tried to accomplish will be in vain. You have to become the Rebbe. And on that advice, he became the Rebbe. Became the Rebbe. And you can understand how strong it was because until quite literally his dying day, he saw 
his father-in-law, the, the Friedrich Rebbe, is his Rebbe. And it's known that from the for 40 years, except for there were less than a handful of occasions that he ever left Crown Heights, except once a week, he would go to his father-in-law's grave and he would stay there all day. And he would bring with him the, the, uh, the bag of all of the letters that he had gotten that week. And he would stay there all day in, in communion with the soul of his father-in-law. So when his wife said, if you don't become Rebbe, everything that he tried to accomplish will be in vain. So he, he listened to her. And she paid a very high price for it. A very, very high price for it because her husband then became like public property in a sense. And without going into it, it did create tremendous tension between the two sisters. And that was a very, very unfortunate outcome. And unfortunately, for 40 years, there was, there was a, a lot of tension in the family because of it. Okay. Can I interrupt you one second? Yeah. Just one of the scenes in the coloring book is from this week's Parsha and Korach and the earth opening up and everybody saw it to the videos of the, what happened in the parking lot of Shari Tzedek. It's like, is that not straight out of the Parsha? This is family machloket. This is what happens. The earth rumbles. Okay. Um, we're running um, close to our time limit here. And I have a couple of really good ones left, so I'm going to try to um, do it very short. One, I think everyone's heard, is called the Maiden of Ludmir. This was a very unusual story. She lived in the early 1800s, and she acted like a Rebbe. She was very controversial. She was extremely well-learned. She, um, she did not go out of her way um, to show charisma, but people were drawn to her, including men. And she would have a tish on Shabbos. People would come to her for brachas. She would pray for people. And she conducted herself like a Rebbe. She was yes. called the Maiden of Ludmir. Yes. Ah, there, there are opinions that she would stay behind the Mechitza and only the women would join her in that side. And the men were on the other side of the Mechitza during the Tish. She would give over Torah all the time. And she had not just women followers, she had men followers. You can imagine it was very controversial. And her father was a student of uh, Rabbi Mordechai Tversky, who was of the Chernobyl. Um, almost all the Chernobyl children became Rebbe's in their own um, way. When we were in Denver, we were part of Mordechai Tversky's community in Denver. He was the Hornist type. Of yeah, he was, uh, the Chernobyl had many, many sons. They all became Rebbe's. And they're all connected to Chernobyl. So her father was a close student of the one of the Chernobyl rabbis. So he, uh, the, the father, at a certain point, said, "Please go to my rabbi and like to check if what you're doing is the right thing here." Because, like I said, there was a lot of opposition to how she was conducting it, and she wasn't married. So she went to the Rebbe and the Rebbe said, it's, you know, keep on learning, but it's too much controversy. You don't need all this controversy and you should get married. <clears throat> she listened to him and she stopped um, acting like a Rebbe and she got married. The marriage lasted very short, just did not work. She moved to, Yerushalayim in the um, like 1870s. And 
she again started conducting herself like a Rebbe in Yerushalayim. And she had students. She had students. And she would give tishes and say Torah. And every Rosh Chodesh, she would lead a group to Kever Rachel. And that's where they would like learn and daven at Kever Rachel. She, that was her big thing. Every Rosh Chodesh, today is Rosh Chodesh, she would go to Kever Rachel. Okay. That I'm not sure. Like I said, she had she had no problem having men students, and men had no problem, the men who followed her had no problem as treating her like a rabbi. Treating her like a rabbi. Yeah, I'm sorry. The stipler rabbi? I, I've heard of him, of course. Okay, okay. I, I just, I hadn't thought of it before, but just so we can understand, maybe in our time, someone like Nechama Leibowitz. She had men and women students, and she would lecture. She was my teacher in seminary. Right? And she would, she would, what? She, we're going back like 20, 30, 40 years. 50 years. She wrote many, many books. She was, she was my very teacher. famous in Israel, very famous. And she could keep her own with just about anyone. And she, um, she was very, very well known in her, in her time. She, she's not alive now. But there are many books that she wrote also. But in her day, she, men and women would go to her lectures. Today, you also have a, 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 a Viva Zorenberg, Zorenberg yeah, who teaches uh, at the Israel Center. Men and women go to her go to her lectures. Then you have uh, uh, Yemima, Yemima, but she only does for women. She only does, and she, you know, she draws hundreds of women all the and time. Sari Yehudi Schneider has an yeah. international uh, correspondence school. People write into yes. her from all over. She lives in the old city of Yerushalayim. Yeah. That's still boys. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, two more people in short is um, uh, uh, Sarah Schneerer, who is um, known as the, the initiator of the Beis Yaakov movement. Our four granddaughters go to Beis Yaakov yeah. in Yerushalayim and Lattersdorf. I, I, I did quite a bit of research about her. I, I don't have time to give it all over, but, um, but she, she, um, she lived, one second, 1882 to 1935, Poland, Poland, Poland. And just in short, in short, she was an educator and it bothered her terribly that so many room young women were not getting proper education and were being drawn to either Zionism or to Polish culture. And she really wanted to do something about this. She was in Vienna for a while and, and she became close to the teachings of um, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, who was very open to teaching women. And what I found out is I had always heard that she was the initiator of the Beis Yaakov movement, which is true and it's not 100% true. What happened is she went to the Belzer Rebbe and she asked for a blessing to do something about losing so many young from women. And he gave her a blessing, but it was just in general. So what happened, apparently there were already, uh, there were some schools for women already. 
It wasn't that there were none, but there were few and far between. And so what she did, she started a kindergarten. She started a kindergarten. And um, it had tremendous success. And more and more from families wanted to send their young children before it became problematic. And what happened was <coughs> the, the, uh, the Aguda movement saw that what she was doing was like amazing. So she started with one kindergarten. Five years later, she was running seven. And in 19, this is, uh, this is the late 20s. By 1933, there were 265 um, schools run by the, the, the Aguda, the Aguda. Right, right. So she had great support from the Chafetz Chaim, from, uh, from the Ger Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe, and from Rabbi Chaim Ozer Grotnevsky. So she got the support and she is critical in the whole movement, but it wasn't like she did it single-handedly. It, it, she, she, all these Rebbe's drew their weight behind her and started sending their daughters. So, but she deserves the credit. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Absolute revolution in, in the Jewish world. Absolute revolution. So that, so by 1933, there were 265 schools just in Poland. And now, of course, Beis Yaakov is brought everywhere, everywhere. And she deserves the credit. I'm gonna end with one last story, which is an amazing story. Amazing story. <clears throat> there are lots of questions about it that I don't have the answers to, but when the Alter Rebbe um, began spreading Chabad Hasidus, so it, 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 it was somewhat controversial. He, he was a student of the Magi. One of many, the Magi trained an entire generation of Rebbe's. But the only one that the Magi gave permission to use the language of the Ariza, meaning to talk in very Kabbalistic terms, was the Altar Rebbe. So the Altar Rebbe used to have uh, Yechidas until there were just too many people. But the, the, the Hasidim were complaining, like, how are we going to be connected to you? There was no Tanya yet. So the altar Rebbe started putting out, we could imagine it by the little booklets, not booklets, the little pamphlets we get in shul every Shabbos, everyone in the world now puts out a little four page pamphlet. So the altar Rebbe started doing this. It was a huge Kiddush in his day. He was, starting in little pamphlets, putting out his, his mimers. And what happened was even the students of the Magi were up in arms, like, this is not Torah, you just put out in, in the open like this. This is like, this is not supposed to be so open. Even, and, and not to say those who were not Hasidah, they were like, this is like crazy. So anyways, in short, there was starting to be enormous pressure on, on the altar Rebbe to not be spreading Hasidus like this. And for about six months, the students could see that he was, things were weighing down in him. A few weeks before Rosh Hashanah, I don't remember which year, in the middle of a mimer, he cried out, <laughs> he cried out, um, Zaidi, Abba, help me, protect me. And he fainted. The, the Zaidi was the Baal Shem Tov, and the Abba was the Magi. And or I think he said Rebbe, Zaidi and Rebbe. And People understood, understood what, what was going on these six months. 
is that he understood that there was in heaven like a, a, a prosecution. Again, there was heavy energy against his spreading of Hasidus. And so the story goes, this is a story within Chabad. His, he had many children. One of them was Devora Leah. Devora Leah was incredibly dedicated to her father. The altar Rebbe taught all of his children, including his, his daughters. And she understood what he was trying to accomplish. And she understood the, the spiritual dangers of doing such a thing. So she called three of the top uh, followers of the altar Rebbe and said, I want you to be a bait in. A bait din, a, a, like a court, a court. And I, I'm going to reveal certain things to you, but I will only do so if you promise to do what I said and support what I said. And so how can we do such a thing? We don't know what you're going to say. She said, I'm telling you, my father's life depends on this. So they were like, they, they took counsel for 24 hours, and they came back and said, okay, because they understood something was very wrong here. And, and, and they feared for the altar record. So she revealed to them, she said, I am going to give up my life in exchange that my father can live. And I want you to be the bait in to approve this. And they were like, how can you ask this of us? We'll give our lives. But you, you can't ask, ask us to do it. She said, you promised. You promised, and I'm determined to do this. And you have to go along with it. So to make a long story short, somehow the altar Rebbe gets wind of what his daughter is planning. And he tries to talk her out of it. She won't even make herself available to talk with him. On Rosh Hashanah, he calls her in to give her a blessing, especially for long life. And she like, she, she kind of stopped him. And she said, I only want one thing from you. That you promise to take care of my son. Two years old. Who was, who was, I think, two years old at that. That was the Tzema setting. And so he promised. And Song Gedalia, she passed away. She passed away. And so in Chabad, he was yeah, yeah. in Chabad, she became like a legend. And many, many uh, girls in Chabad are named Devoraleya. Okay, after her, the story is like beyond the beyond how we can understand this. Didn't Rabbi Tversky in Denver do something like that where when he was very sick that he exchanged the life of a child that was sick, that the child could live and he he passed away. He was sick. Yes, anyway. there there is talk in the family about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah, we know we actually know the whole the whole story. I don't know all of the details. Um, and but I don't, we know that child who yeah, survived. Yeah, we, we, we know the whole story. I don't know, um, I'll just say, I don't know to what extent he offered his life in exchange, but it was known that he took a lot upon himself <clears throat> and, and the, the child not only lived, but were like best sure. friends with the family. So we, yeah, we do know the story. So, this is just an incredible, incredible story. So it's known that the Alter Rebbe literally raised his, um, his grandson, who became the Tzemach Tzedek, and, and he, he let it be known his whole life that he will be Rebbe. He will be the Rebbe. And actually, the Tzemach Tzedek actually lived in his, his learning room. That's where he slept. And for 25 years, he learned with the Tzemach Tzedek every single day um, for a, a substantial amount of time. Because he made, this, he made this promise. 
and and of course later the Tanya came out and everything in Chabad became what the Chabad became. So in Chabad, she is given in a sense the credit for the, the success of the Alter Rebbe and the success of the Chabad movement. <laughs> So we'll end with a bracha. We always try to end with a bracha. And that my, my, my wife alluded to it, that uh, our day is very, very, very different than a lot of the stories we told, that the opportunities for women to learn, to teach, to be mashpias. We're very close to the, the Chabad movement and a lot you mentioned all the cities that we visited. A lot of them were sponsored by, by Chabad. And of course, in all of these cities, you have couples. And it's not just the men who are instrumental in, in the Chabad movement. We've seen it with our own eyes that the women take an extremely active role in the education, in the outreach, in every aspect of Chabad, in all of these cities, literally all over the How world. How many shluchas are there? There's seven. over 4,000 families out there. But that's yeah. also in every way, in every show now. Yes. You want to see the wife. Yes, you absolutely. The wife. Yeah, it's and a different a world now. Yeah. It's a different world. And, the women? and it is a tremendously positive thing. Tremendously positive thing that Seriously. women are 50, per, actually they're probably like 52% uh, <laughs> of Am Yisrael. And, and the time has come. And according to many, that the part of the coming of Mashiach, that this is one of the greatest signs. Mm. In Kabbalah, it's given over that one of the greatest signs is when women with will find their, their full and true stature among Am Yisrael. So we are definitely living in redemptive times. The moon. And yes, the moon will become like full, right? The moon will become full, like we say in uh, Kiddush Levana, that a time will come when the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun. So this is symbolic that the light of women will be like the men, maybe even more, maybe even more. I'm many. <laughs>